Wow, uh, Thaley's conclusion is uh, <laughs> kind of all over the place. Now, uh, Thales didn't just you know, reach this conclusion out of thin air. He had an argument for it, uh, but his, or at least reasoning for it. Um, but his uh, reasoning starts with a presumption. So um, what's the presumption that Thales starts with? And it's a presumption that we tend to think is true today. Thales starts with a presumption, and the presumption is that all of this right, that you see around you every day has to have some kind of common unity, some commonality, something that makes it fundamentally the same. Right? I mean, all of this works really well together. Yeah. <clears throat> Plants grow out of ground and water. Right, uh, air is uh, all around us. You know, nothing's exploding randomly, or you know, <laughs> uh, uh, things behave in a regular order. There's a pattern to the to reality, especially to the natural world. Okay. So Thales presumes then it's not an argument, right? It's a presumption. Presumes then that uh, since all of this works really well together. Uh, there has to be some kind of commonality, some kind of unity. And what he thinks it is, is a common stuff, right? A common material that all of this, all of this has. It's composed in some way of this material, of this stuff. Right. Now, that's the presumption he starts with. Then he concludes, right, with this presumption and with a bit of reasoning, he concludes that what everything has in common is water. Okay, so we know the presumption that Thales started with, that there's a commonality to all this stuff since it works so well together. And uh, you know, he reaches the conclusion that all, what's common to everything is water. But how did he reach this conclusion? Thales, <laughs> as you saw from the readings, Thales was not, uh, you know, not your <laughs> ordinary person walking in the street, right? He was rather clever and he knew how to, well, he knew how to make some observations. Uh, now, he, uh, he starts with the presumption that everything has a commonality. So then how did he reach the conclusion that it's water? Well, he took a look around. <laughs> hey, it doesn't take long before you realize that water is, a, is of at least some importance to life, <laughs> right? Uh, when water dries up, everything around it dies. Right? You are mostly water, right? Now, Thales, right, by water, we mean dihydrogen monoxide, H2O. Okay, Thales didn't mean that. Hydrogen and oxygen weren't really on the horizon at that point. Uh, Thales, what Thales meant by water was, well, you know, this stuff, right? Uh, something that we'd probably identify as clear liquid. But even Thales was familiar with the idea that uh, liquid, uh, that, sorry, that water could uh, suspend other materials in it and have other things mixed in it. So just looking out here, right, we see that, you know, this isn't exactly pure water, right? <laughs> we see a lot of stuff floating around. Uh, if you take a look in these pools, you can see things moving around in the water. It's alive, right? or the, you know, there are things alive in the water. Uh, there's water all around this area right now. It's soaked into the soil. Um, if we, you know, if you were to, uh, uh, I don't know, if you've ever walked around, say, Enchanted Rock, or some of these other state natural areas, uh, you'd see water coming up out of the ground. Water falls from the sky. It just got finished falling from the sky here not too long ago. We got quite a lot of water. 
water uh, is in these plants. If you were to you know, take a vine or fruit, right? You take a grapes and you squish the grapes. What do you get that comes out? Grape water. <laughs> uh, if you take uh, an orange and you, you know, smash it open, you get orange water, orange juice, right? Uh, these vines and ivies that are growing in the bushes or on the trees, you snap them open and you get this liquidy stuff that comes out, right? This we call it sap, yeah, but it's also a good chunk of its water, and Thales would have recognized that. You know, if we cut ourselves open, right, red water <laughs> comes out. Um, yeah, water's coming up out of the ground. If you've ever been on, uh, say, at the beach, there's water all around. It seems to go on forever. It's not hard to think that that's that beyond that, there's just more water, right? It just keeps going. So. Uh, Thales went looking for a commonality of what all this has in common. Okay? For that singular substance that's with or amongst all it and seeping in and constituting all these things. He thought it's water. Well, Anaximander reaches a very different conclusion than Thales. Thales concludes that everything is water. So, what does Anaximander conclude? He concludes something very different from water. And, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's very different from water. Why would he reach this seemingly bizarre conclusion? Like I said, Anaximander's conclusion is very different from Thales. Thales' conclusion is that everything is composed of water. Right? It pervades everything. Yeah. Anaximander, well, he says everything is the boundless. Right? It's composed of the boundless. It's composed, it's constituted, it's made up of the infinite. Right? So just to give you an idea of the difference, right? Everything you know, everything you've come to understand, everything that you experience out here in the world is finite. Right? It has edges, it has boundaries, it has something of what makes it, it, and not something else. Right? So just looking at this trail here, right? this trail is a defined trail. It has edges on the left and the right. It has a length. We can walk down at the, the entire length of this thing is about a half a mile. Uh, it has a defined surface. It has boundaries. It has what makes it it as opposed to the trees and the grass and the bushes. Even the water that's coming across it is not the same thing as the trail. And the water is going to disappear eventually. And this will dry up some, but the trail will remain. You come to understand what this is by its boundaries, by its limits. Yeah. Same thing with trees. There's something what makes a tree a tree and not, say, an animal or the sky or the ground from up which the tree comes. Yeah. The tree has edges. It has boundaries. There's a finite number of leaves and branches on this tree. The clouds in the sky are not the same thing as the rest of the sky. As amorphous as the clouds are, there's still a boundary, a limit to the clouds. Yeah. All of everything that you come to understand and believe in the world is finite. You don't understand the infinite. So why would Anaximander say that all of this right, is composed of the infinite? Water is at least a finite substance. You can hold it. You can see it. You can believe it. The boundless? You don't understand that at all. Okay. But this is the big difference between Anaximander's theory, Anaximander's conclusion, I should say, and Thales. Thales says fundamentally all this stuff is water. It was liquid. <laughs> Even these rocks at some point were liquid. Right? I mean, weren't necessarily 
hydrogen, uh, dihydrogen monoxide? No, but there is such a thing as liquid rock, or it's you know, magma or lava, whichever the one it is. I forget which one's supposed to be. <laughs> one is above ground, one's below ground. It's, I think it's something like that. But there's still liquid rock. And Thales would have been aware of this, right? He would have seen volcanoes. He would know what a liquid rock is. <clears throat> At least with liquid, we can see around and see how these things either... Uh, you know, we're at once liquid or come from liquid. But the boundless? The boundless is reality unlimited. This is reality limited. That's a huge difference between those two things. So why would Anaximander say everything around here Everything you've ever experienced is composed of limitless reality. So we're asking the question why Anaximander would even bother saying that everything's composed of the boundless. After all, it's not like he's seen it. You can't see the boundless. You and I can only see finite definite things. We can only understand finite definite things. There's no point in trying to see, quote unquote, see the boundless. So why would he even think this? Well, if you dismiss him as just an idiot, you've probably made a mistake. Just because somebody disagrees with you or even says something you don't understand doesn't mean there isn't reason for it. Doesn't mean there's always reason for it, but it doesn't necessitate that there's no reason for it. You know, I imagine in Annex Mander's case, you know, he's like a lot of these philosophers. He tried to take the suggestion seriously that there's a commonality to all these things. Right? Something you know, that is stuff that composes everything else. Well, what would it be? Maybe he didn't agree with Thales. Or maybe just something as simple as this. Right? He looked at water and said, well, you know, it kind of looks like water is composed of something else. Well, what could it be? And maybe he tried to define <laughs> Try to figure out what composes water. Trying to understand what water is by understanding, you know, how we come to understand it. Right? Well, yeah, think about it. Anytime you try to define something, anytime you try to explain it or understand it, seems like we have to understand it in terms of two other things. Right? Everything that we understand or know is limited. So when we define it, we have to define it in terms of two other things. So for instance, right. just uh, this bridge, right? Well, what's a bridge? I don't know, you know, a rough attempt at defining bridge. It's a, a structure intended to help someone cover, you know, to cross an obstacle. In this case, a creek bed. Well, now we've you know, to understand what bridge is, we have to understand structure, person, obstacle. You know, without that, you can't understand what a bridge is. You can't understand what a bridge is without understanding what a structure is. Bridges are all, always and only made by people, so you, you can't understand bridge without understanding at least persons. And then obstacles, right? What, what's an obstacle? That's a pretty broad definition. And then even any one of those parts, structure, right? Uh, something, what? Structures are uh, artificial creations, um, you know, you know, buildings. Yeah, well, building is an example, but again, <laughs> if we could try to define structure in terms of an example, I have to understand what a building is in order to understand how it's a structure. So that's not going to help. Uh, yeah, so when we try to define these things, we're always defining in terms of two other things. Well, if that's so, and both of these things are supposed to make up the one thing that makes up everything else, what happened to that unity we were looking for, that commonality? Okay. And you think about water. We understand water is dihydrogen monoxide. What would Thales have understood water as? You know, clear liquid, as opposed to all of the stuff that can go into liquid. Well, then what's liquid? What's clear? Is clear a stuff? Probably not. Well, then what's liquid? Well, what? Squishy stuff? 
it's getting a little difficult to define water now. And if you can't explain what water is, well, we really can't explain why all of this stuff is made of water. Right? Well, now, you might say that we don't have this problem today because we know what water is. Water is dihydrogen monoxide. All right. So water is composed of two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Well, we still define in terms of two other things. Now we got to define oxygen. Now we get to define hydrogen. And by the way, now we got to, we got to define part and two. <laughs> and that's taking a bit. Well, let's, let's forget about part and two for a little bit. Uh, what about hydrogen? What about oxygen? What are these? Well, they're both gases. Okay, you tell me they're both gases, but that doesn't tell me uh, what they are. You just told me how they're alike. What, what, how do we define hydrogen? Hydrogen is hydrogen is uh, composed of uh, you know one proton and one neutron, and oxygen is composed of eight protons, eight neutrons, and eight electrons. Well, now we got to define protons, neutrons, and electrons. And this is going to be defined in terms of quarks, and these are going to be defined in terms of strings, right? Yeah, so you. <laughs> you start going down the list uh, in in physics, and pretty soon, you, you, well, first of all, you got things that you and I don't even recognize anymore. So how can we plausibly say that these things are, you know, we understand what water is in terms of hydrogen and oxygen? So one big problem that Thales is running into here and in trying to define what all this stuff is, is you always have to define it in terms of two other things. Well, if you define it in terms of two other things, there goes that unity we were hoping for, that commonality that all things are composed of. Yikes. Well, Anaximander says, well, well, okay, so maybe we can't do it in terms of two things. Let's just try in terms of one. <laughs> so water is liquid. Great. What, what, what's liquid? Well, liquid is fluid. Okay, well, what's fluid? Well, fluid is flowing. <laughs> you can just try and keep up coming up with synonyms for uh, uh, water, but it isn't going to do you much good. I mean, we only understand water if you understand liquid. You only understand liquid if you understand fluid. You only understand fluid if you, whatever your other synonyms are. And the meaning of one is, you know, at best contained and the other, so you're just kind of repeating yourself at this point. So water, well, what's that? Well, it's water. And what's that? Well, you know, it's water. So defining in terms of one other thing isn't going to work because that's just a synonym. Defining in terms of two other things isn't going to work because there goes the unity. Not to uh, So what, you define in terms of nothing? That seems weird. What's water? Well, you know, it's, it's of nothing. No, that's not going to work. So I think this is the problem that Anaximander found here. Is look, anytime you try to define all of these things, trees, paths, bridges, people, water, grass, bushes, you're always, always, always going to have to define in terms, or what, you know, what we do is we define in terms of another defined thing. But that defined thing itself has edges, itself has boundaries, has something else of what makes it what it is. So that's not going to answer the question. It's always going to be in terms of something else. What he concludes is anytime you try to define in terms of a defined thing, you're not going to do it. You're not going to be able to explain what everything is if you use defined, limited things. Well, then what's left? The unlimited. All of this reality, all this limited reality can't be, can't exist in terms of some other limited reality. So it has to be unlimited, the boundless. So Annex Amenis offers his own conclusion how is his conclusion different from both Thales and Anaximander? Why did he reject Anaximander's conclusion? And, you know, he rejects Anaximander's conclusion. Why doesn't he just go back to Thales? Well, 
Anaximenes' conclusion, air, uh, is not the boundless, right? Boundless is reality unlimited. It's everywhere and uh, everything, right? Well, that's not the air. Air is it's pretty amorphous, granted, right? There's air all around here, uh, but it still has a volume, right? It still has physical properties, yeah? Air is, uh, you know, I can interact with air, right? I'm doing it right now, I'm interacting with air. I can also interact with water, right? I can splash water, throw it around. Right? So you can interact and, and experience both air and water because they're both limited, defined things. So it's not the boundless, because boundless is reality unlimited. I can't hold the boundless in my hand. That'd be a limit on it. Uh, similarly, right, it's not water either. Water is, it's amorphous to an extent, but air is even more amorphous. <laughs> it's, it's all around. So why did he reject Ander, Anaximander's conclusion? Well, <laughs> you know, you did, right? <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't have much trouble rejecting Anaximander's conclusion, but why did Anaximander's? Uh, you know, to your mind, likely, you reject Anaximander's conclusion because it sounds too, what, too mystical or too hokey or, you know, what have you. Uh, and Anaximenes rejects Anaximander's conclusion because, well, frankly, you can't understand the boundless. Right? Try to picture the boundless right now. Try to picture the boundless. Close your eyes and try to picture the boundless. You're not picturing the boundless. Likely you're picturing, what, gassy clouds, maybe a star field, right? You know, a bunch of stars going to that limitless expanse, that sort of thing. That's not the boundless. That's all a limited, defined thing. Uh, as I said before, you can't understand the infinite. You can only understand the finite. So you can almost see this conversation, right, between <laughs> Anaximander and Anaximander. Anaximander says, I have figured out what everything is. I figured out the ultimate reality. Anaximander says, gee, Mr. Anaximander, that's great. What is it? Anaximander says, it is the boundless. It is the boundless. Wow, what's that? What's that, Mr. Anaximander? I cannot tell you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, great answer. You tell me that you figured it out, but you can't tell me what it is. That, that either sounds mean or you probably don't know what you're talking about. Right? <laughs> so the, this answer of the boundless is something that you fundamentally can't understand. You don't even really know if it exists. Uh, and it, you know, okay, you have reasons for it, but um, it's not like that that answer really helps us understand this commonality to all things. Yeah. So, uh, Anaximander rejects the conclusion because, frankly, it's not much good to us. Yeah. So why not just go back to Thales? Well, um, there's still something to the idea of uh, that the limited things have to come from a more limitless things, right? And air is about, at least in our common experience, air is about as limitless as it gets. Right? It's, yes, I, it has volume, but I can, you know, do this through all of it, and I don't really disturb, I mean, I move the air a little bit, but it, it's not like I'm destroying air. I can, you know, push up against this edge here, and either my hand is going to give or the edge is going to give, right? Um, these are very hard defined things. Air is not very hard. It's very soft, right? You can move through air rather easily. So there, there, that's part of it. Right? But, you know, we could probably even carry it even further, right? Uh, and Thales looked around and was trying to find this commonality to all things. Well, wa you know, water's common. Don't get me wrong. We, we can't do much of anything around here. Without water, you live about, what, uh, three days, I think it is? You can live about three days without water, right? Living, you know, things die without water. Without air, you live a significantly less amount of time. <laughs> uh, you, you can almost see Anaximena is kind of teasing Thales at this point, saying, you know, anything water can do, air can do better. <laughs> air, you know, water may fall from the sky, but that sky always has air. Uh, yeah, we, we could take all the evidence that Thales gives for the commonality of water and say, sure, fine, that's great. But air is even more out there, right? You say water falls from the sky. Well, the sky is air, right? And uh, you know, have burning things, right? Do things ever burn, right? Things, you know, turn up into smoke and they turn into air. It returns back to air. Uh, we, we can do a lot 
with air. Everything needs water for everything living needs water for life. Well, everything living needs air, air for life as well. You can't do much of anything without air. So Thales didn't just simply ret- excuse me, Anaximenes didn't simply just return to Thales' conclusion. He took his reasoning and improved upon it. Right? All three are still dealing with this presumption that there's some commonality to everything that exists. Right, so we ask them, what does it mean to exist? And they say, well, I'll tell you what it means to exist by, by telling you what this commonality. And the commonality right, is composition. I will tell you what it means to exist. By in, I will tell you what it means to answer the question, what does it mean to exist, by answering the question, of what is it composed? Right. Thales says it's composed of water. Anaximander says it's composed of the boundless. Anaximander says it's composed of air. All right. Now, Anaximenes has concluded that everything is composed of air. To which Anaximander says, great, nice job, student. What's air? And then Anaximander's problem starts up all over again. Because we're either going to define air in terms of other defined things or nothing. More than one defined thing, in which case, goodbye unity. Just one other defined thing, so we're just saying, repeating ourselves or, or nothing, in which case. Eh. So air isn't going to answer the question any better than water will. And frankly, you know, we keep def- you know, dividing reality up from these substances to uh, atoms, from atoms to subatomic particles, from subatomics down to quarks, from quarks down to strings. Well, if we, if we had Annex Humanity here in front of us, right, and, he said, and we told him, we figured out what all this is. At bottom, it's everything's a string. It's a four-dimensional string looped in one dimension of, uh, one-dimensional space. Depending on how the string vibrates, you get different kinds of quarks. Depending on combinations of quarks, you get your protons, neutrons, electrons. Depending on your combinations of protons, neutrons, electrons, you get your different atoms. Depending on your different combinations of atoms, you get molecules. Depending on combinations of atoms and molecules, you get the different substances. Depending on different combinations of substances, you get the different things around you. We've gone that far. We're down to strings. Annex Manus is great. That's amazing work. I never in my last day would have imagined a one-dimensional, a, 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 a one-dimensional string. Did I say four dimensional? A one-dimensional string looped in four dimensions of space. <laughs> Sorry. A one-dimensional string looped in four dimensions of space. Never would have imagined that ever. What's the string made of? Mm-hmm.